Gupta. There is much expectation all around of a big change. But what is this change? What is its nature? This great change is the appearance on earth of a new race, a race which will be for man what man is for the animal. Perhaps the difference between the new race and the present man will be even greater in fact, this race is ready to appear on earth. It is preparing the ground for itself. It is there on the subtle physical plane and is acting upon the earth to prepare for its own materialization. It is acting at the same time on man and all those who are fit and open to its influence and being illumined by it. Anyway, the advent of this new race is inevitable. It is decreed by the Supreme. The first requisite on the spiritual path is aspiration. One knocks at the gate of spiritual life because one aspires for it. It is the aspiration, the will in the seeker, the yearning of his soul for the divine that pushes him forward and carries him on the difficult path of yoga. To aspire means to yearn for something, to yearn for something higher or for the highest something, the divine. But the nature of this aspiration depends on its source, on the level of consciousness from which it comes. It may be a mental aspiration, a seeking of the mind, or it may be a vital aspiration, a yearning of the emotional part of the being for something truer and more permanent. It may even be a physical aspiration, an aspiration for beauty and perfection, for permanence and immortality. And it may be a psychic aspiration, the will of the inmost soul trying to express itself. In fact, the other aspirations are only reflections of this inmost psychic yearning. It is this which can carry one through up to the end, and it is this which can harmonize the other aspirations and unite them in a synthesis. In the synthesis also there may be different degrees, but on the whole it is the psychic that is the leader of the path, the true force and guide on the way. In our yoga, work is an indispensable means of sadhana. In truth, life means action. One cannot do without it. But when you consciously offer your work to the divine, when you do it as a service to the divine, the work changes its character. It becomes an offering. Then the work in itself, the nature of the work, matters no more. It is your attitude the spirit behind your work, the state of your consciousness, the way you do it, the effort you put in to perfect it, that becomes important. And there may be two types of work. In the beginning, whatever work comes to you, you do it for the divine. And you do not make any distinction between this work or that work. You do it in the way of the Gita, without ego, with a disinterested attitude, with the spirit of dedication. But then there is another type of work, a work that is the expression of your being, a work for which you are destined, which is the mission of your life. The work that comes out of the demand of your soul is the real expression of your inmost life, 
and it may not be anything you are doing at present. A mathematician may blossom into a poet. A dreaming poet may suddenly become a severe man of action. These are not rare phenomena. One starts from the first type and arrives at the second. Published April 1983 Mother's Playground Mother gave this infinite freedom to her children because that was the only way of creating a new, a new nature. She showed also the difference between the right use of freedom and the wrong use. The wrong use is often found in the movements of freedom outside in normal life, for example, in the student movement or the women's emancipation movement. Now, when women are fighting for freedom for themselves, they consider themselves as women fighting for freedom against men. We are women. You are men. You enjoy privileges and rights. We are denied them. We want them. We claim them. In the youth movement also, the young people say, all the powers the old people enjoy, the positions and the emoluments, all that we will not do, we want to share these things also along with the old. Mother said, no, this is not the right attitude. You must change your position, your point of view. Going out for a quarrel, for a fight, means that you consider yourselves different beings with different powers, capacities, constitutions. First of all, you must consider yourselves, both parties, as human beings, not as two different species. This point of view is being acknowledged to some extent nowadays, but it is not sufficient. Mother says, if you are content to be human beings, just human beings, differences will arise again and again, and not only differences, but serious differences. Human nature is composed of these differences, and culture and civilization mean nothing more than a reconciliation, a compromise among these differences. And the result has been that we have not gone very far towards a solution. A deeper truth has to be found, a higher truth, and a more powerful truth. We must rise to a new state. Mother spoke always of finding the truth, the truth of your soul. In the truth of your soul, you are neither man nor woman, neither young nor old. You are all that only in appearance, for you are something more, something else. You have to take your stand on your soul. That is the lesson that the mother was trying to impart in the playground education. So long as you are in the normal consciousness, embedded in your body consciousness, and view things from there, your life will be built in the pattern created by the body consciousness. Life in that pattern can proceed only through difference and distinction, contrast and contradiction, conflict and battle. So long as you stick to your habitual position, it will be like that. The remedy is a radical remedy. It is to reverse your position. You have to stand not on your legs, but on your head. Then you will find the way to march forward, not through confrontation, but cooperation, not through separation, but union, not through difference, but identity. So long as you are mere human beings, this supreme soul identity cannot come. You have to forget the differences. Someone asked the mother in one of the playground talks, how is it possible for one to forget this fundamental difference that one is a man and another a woman? Mother answered, how can you say that? Look here. When I talk to Tara, do you think I am considering her as a woman and talking accordingly? And she could have added, and when I answer you, Nolini, 
Do you think I am speaking to a masculine person? I may narrate here a little incident concerning me personally. It was with regard to the question of age. When someone informed mother that they wanted to celebrate my birthday, perhaps it was my 80th birthday, in a magnificent manner, a gala celebration, mother roared out, No, no, you are spoiling my work. All the while I have been trying to make him forget his age, and now you are trying to insist on it. Age also is a thing to be forgotten. The birthday celebration is not for recording the progress in our age, how we are progressing year by year in our age, that is, how we are getting old. No, it is for noting the progress made in the inner being and consciousness. Each birthday is meant to be a landmark of the forward march of your consciousness, not the grayness of your head. The touch of your soul will inspire you not merely to do the right inner movement, the enlightening of your consciousness, but it will inspire you to do the right physical movement, even lead you to choose the right kind of physical exercises and do them in the right manner. The lesson to learn then is to get back to your soul inside you. You will find there everything that is worth having, freedom, joy, harmony, and even untold capacity. People coming from outside asked very often, and ask even now, what is the ashram doing for the country, for the world? Its work is confined to a few people only. Is it worth doing? Mother answered simply, I am doing something which is not done anywhere else in the world. I am awakening the soul in my children, the soul that can alone save and nothing else. To the outsiders we say, If you come here, come with eyes to see, eyes to look at, or rather to look into the soul of the people who are here. Do not look at what they learn, or what they do, or what they say, but look inside them. Look at what is there, deep within. Even now I say, She is there within you. Her work is not arrested. The tempo of her work is as vigorous and as living as it could be, and its impact will become more and more clear and manifest. So I repeat, the soul is neither boy nor girl, nor young nor old. It has not the characteristics of the body natural to man, or rather to the animal. But this does not mean that it has no body, and that it is something airy, nebulous, smoky? Not at all. The soul has a body, its own body, as concrete and definite as the physical body. It even has a material body, although its matter is of a different kind. Have not the Western sages begun to speak of the immaterial matter of antimatter? That soul body you are carrying even now within this material body of yours. You can sense it as definite and living as the external body. The mother is holding it in you. You come in contact with it through your contact with the mother. Love the mother. Be one with her. Then you will find and be this living soul of yours. Published August 1978. After I knew that God was a woman, Nolini Da comments on Sri Aurobindo's aphorism number 411. We find that in Sri Aurobindo's Thoughts and Aphorisms, in the section on Bhakti, there is the following aphorism which may sound a little mysterious, if not downright provocative. Quote, After I knew that God was a woman, I learned something from far off about love. 
but it was only when I became a woman and served my master and paramour that I knew love utterly. Aphorism 411, Collected Works of Sri Aurobindo, 12 through 481. At least it provoked someone to ask the mother this question, which appears on 330 of Volume 10 of the Collected Works of the Mother. What does Sri Aurobindo mean when he says, After I knew that God was a woman? The mother had replied, I cannot answer, because while he was in his body, he never told me anything about this. If anyone knows the exact date on which he wrote this, it might be an indication. Perhaps N could tell you when this was written or whether Sri Aurobindo told him anything about it. I thought the N referred to by the mother must surely be Nolini Da. So one day I read out loud just the aphorism to him and asked him what it meant. In response, the usual silence greeted me. I reminded him that it was the mother who actually suggested that one may ask N, and that I believe that he himself must be that knowledgeable N who was now trying to behave in an elusive manner. I then admonished him that if he chose to disregard the mother's choice, well, I would certainly leave him to his fate, unperturbed in his incommunicableness. One could really take quite a few cheeky liberties of this kind with him, to our own and even to his delight too. Now the silence was broken with Nolini saying, the meaning is very clear. This did not help much, but I chose not to pursue the matter further. However, in the evening when I returned and when nobody else was around, Nolinida, without any word of introduction, went straight to the point, to the heart of the matter, one may say. Without much ado, this is how he began. Nolini says, you see, the Vedant, you see, the Vedantic experience is essentially a masculine experience. Brahman is Anandamaya, but not Premamaya. The masculine experience goes up to the level of the heart, up to even the soft and subtle emotions of the heart. But that is not love. The origin of love is from a center behind the heart. In this universe, the possibility of love begins with the Parashakti, the Divine Mother. In this sense, Sri Aurobindo is referring to the coming of the Mother here and the fusion of her experience with his. Then followed a few moments of silence and then, Nalini says, of course, Mother knew what he meant. She was only being modest. She just wanted to know if Sri Aurobindo had spoken about it sometime. Silence again. After this, any further word or elaboration or elucidation would have only been redundant. I have deliberately used quotation marks in the passages above because although I had heard them only once, the power of these words was such that they have remained permanently etched in my memory. I have just repeated his words verbatim. Narrated by Matri Prasad. Yeah.